Good morning and welcome to the Education and Skills Committee, our 20th meeting in this session. And the first item of business is a third evidence session on the committee's inquiry into music tuition in schools. This week, the, week, the committee is hearing from representatives of three local authorities um, and we've had an informal session with a number of students and teachers from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland last Thursday to hear about their experiences. So I would like to thank those who took part in that session. And I welcome today Councillor Chris Cunningham, Convener of Education City of Glasgow City Council, Councillor David Dodds, Executive Councillor for Education, West Lothian Council, and Councillor Willie Wilson, Vice Convener of the Lifelong Learning Committee, Perth and Kinross Council. Um, if you please indicate either to myself or to the clerks if you want to come in and answer any of the questions of the committee. But um, I'd like to start just by asking each member to give an overall view of the challenges facing music tuition in the schools at this time, and particularly outline their approach and their local authority approach to um, the charging of pupils. And if I could come first to Councillor um, Cunningham. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, uh, Glasgow City Council. Um, I'm not sure if it's unique in this regard, but Glasgow City Council does not charge for music tuition. Uh, and in those circumstances, it's an indication of the extent to which we value um, uh, music tuition in our schools. Uh, we believe that we have a very extensive reach. Um, I'd probably take slight issue with the figures that appear in your report uh, or the um, information that's uh, preceded this session. Um, we believe that uh, if you take uh, all of our programmes together, it reaches uh, over 44% of primary and secondary pupils um, in, in the city. Um, uh, we uh, have an extensive programme, uh, both in terms of um, instrumental music and our youth mu music programme, um, and an extensive programme of training of teachers as well as uh, providing tuition to our pupils. Um, we operate in uh, more than 100 of our primary schools out of 138 uh, and all of our secondary schools. Um, I am happy to make comment on the, the issue which I think gave rise to this, uh, namely the, uh, the idea that um, music tuition should be a right um, uh, which is enshrined in law. Um, I'm happy to make comment on that if committee members wish. Um, uh, in general, I think that that's a problematic area for, um, uh, for Parliament to go down, um, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll await the opportunity, if you wish, for me to make further comment on that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dodds? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think uh, instrumental music tuition, like many other areas, is um, facing huge problems uh, due to the underfunding of local government and uh, has left us looking at uh, cutting the funding that we have available. Uh, the intention of West Lothian Council was to try to maintain free tuition on a reduced range of uh, discipline. However, that option was not possible. And for the first time this year, we have introduced charging for instrumental music tuition. Our service prior to that has been um, highly successful. We have a range of disciplines operating in all of our secondary schools and primary schools. Uh, with 13 different bands and ensembles who I think contribute hugely to the life of their uh, schools and communities. And it would be very important for us to see that continue. However, with the options available to us, that uh, has not proved possible. Uh, and I'm happy to go into uh, <coughs> the situation we now face uh, in terms of answering questions and also to answer if that is asked on uh, whether or not legislation would be a potential solution to the issues facing us uh, as a result of the, the current situation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson. Good morning and thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, this is a subject that is very close to my heart. Um, Perth and Gros have a, a long established and high quality instrumental music provision which is available to all pupils. Um, in order to maintain the excellent provision, there is a, a fixed contribution um, that is required from parents in order that their child can access tuition. And we have had um, charges for, for, for many years. Um, we have also looked at the budget for instrumental music um, service, and we have tried hard to protect that in a way that ensures that the service is delivered um, to those who, who, who need it. Um, we did, as part of last year's budget, 
um, after a six-year freeze of fees, um, introduce a 20% increase, um, which meant in some cases that was £50 extra a year, a pound a week. However, um, we are closely monitoring that. Um, we have a no fallback in the number of applications for um, IMS for this year. Um, we understand that some people may be under pressure in, in making payment, and we have got plans to tackle that, which I can elaborate on now or, or later. Um, the, the same applies to our services, to many others, that youngsters who are studying for exams obviously get free, free tuition. Um, we are engaged with our youngsters. Um, we are engaged with our parents, which is really important to make sure that we try and meet their aspirations. Um, I wouldn't say all, we always keep them all happy. I don't think that's life or, 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 or the facts of life. Um, we thought long and hard before we put the charges up, um, and we were faced with the traditional rock and hard place um, that was either to make, diminish the service in some way or maintain the service and increase the charges. We did at the same time introduce um, a £35,000 grant that's available for a bursary scheme for those who may be eligible for a whole variety of reasons to apply for help, financial help. And we've, we've recently launched that and we're, we're getting a, a number of applications in as, as we speak in that. We also work hard with the charitable Perth and Gros Music Foundation, um, which um, we, we we, we want to look a bit further at how we might work further with them. Uh, there's the possibility of buying additional instruments for youngsters who may not have immediate access to them, may not be able to take them home, etc. Um, so we've got a, a number of initiatives in, in that regard. Um, I'll stop there and happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Can I maybe start off by um, asking Chris Cunningham a couple of questions? First of all, to say that I've had direct experience of the wonderful service that Glasgow provides, both as somebody who's attended concerts and as a, um, as a, um, with a child who went through the process. And I, you know, I think it's been a, it has been a fabulous experience. But I'm interested, in, because presumably the choices that Glasgow have made have had consequences elsewhere. And um, in our evidence, it says music is very much regarded as a core subject in Glasgow City Council and funded accordingly. But it is the case that not all subjects are regarded as core subjects. And so you might, for example, not access geography in one school and modern studies in another. What is it about music that has meant that Glasgow's chosen to invest in that way? And presuming that there are the same budgetary pressures in Glasgow as elsewhere, what are the consequences of that choice in terms of provision across our schools? Uh, all local authority education departments need to make choices. Uh, they need to decide whether or not um, uh, one area of expenditure is more important than another. Uh, and they need to balance those judgments um, uh, within the, the, the budgetary constraints that, that exist. Um, we recognise, and, and I'm happy to quote here, the, um, the Scottish Government's uh, 2016 guidance on instrumental teaching in Scotland um, that talks about the fact that uh, music enhances cognitive processes which are shared between music and language, uh, the supporting language development, development and literacy. I, I could go on um, uh, further in that quote, um, uh, but it's recognised that uh, music has wider benefit um, in terms of, uh, of uh, literacy and uh, uh, cognitive development and language development, uh, which, which means that um, there are additional benefits that, that uh, uh, arise from it. Um, I think that's at the core of uh, why we regard it as important in the curriculum, why it has been regarded as important in the curriculum for, uh, uh, for a number of years. I understand that around uh, 10 years ago, um, uh, there was a decision uh, taken by the council to introduce charging, um, and that as a consequence of that, um, the, uh, the participation levels in music tuition uh, dropped very significantly. And the decision was made, I think correctly, um, uh, that um, uh, those charges should be withdrawn. Uh, and I'm advised by officials that it took a number of years uh, to build the program back up again, build the particip participation rates back up again. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, these are never easy choices. 
Um, uh, I entirely understand the point you're making. I, I can't give you detail on, um, on the way in which other subjects have um, been impacted by the various choices that uh, have been made over the years. Um, uh, but at its core, we regard music as important and we, it, it is funded accordingly. Can I ask then, I mean, it would be interesting to know what, you know, sort of a general survey of subject choices across um, councils, but that's maybe for another inquiry altogether in terms of restrictions on, on choices. But um, you say something like 44% of young people get the opportunity to participate. Do you do any analysis of, given the benefits you've identified around music tuition, the extent to which within that, where everybody can access it, to what extent um, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are accessing um, in instrument uh, tuition? So even if it's everybody and everybody can, and uptake is up to everybody, do you ha have strategies in place to ensure that, that young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds may need a bit more support um, that that's monitored closely? Um, we are, I'm absolutely clear and uh, the department is absolutely clear that music tuition is delivered across uh, the entire education estate. Um, I've made reference to more than uh, uh, 100 um, uh, primary schools uh, involving, I think, around 25,000 children. Um, the, um, the authority has, I think, 138 primary schools, so you can see that um, uh, the reach is very extensive. Um, one of the most significant um, uh, programs at the moment is in four primary schools, we're delivering a whole school music approach, uh, and that is in fact in the East End, um, uh, based around, um, I think, East Bank Academy um, uh, in Shettleson. Um, it, the, it would be entirely wrong to categorise um, the music tuition programme within the council as being um, uh, geographically uh, uh, discreet. It's not. It, uh, it covers the entire estate. The question was asked was a slightly different one, which is not a geographical question, but income. That disadvantaged families, young people who may need a little bit more support to be encouraged to access, even if it doesn't cost anything. I wonder if that's something that you monitor, because presumably even across, if there's a reach right across the, the city, which I recognise, 44% of young people take it up. Is that something that you would keep um, under scrutiny that of that 44% is not disproportionately young people from families with relatively better off, relatively better off families. I, I understand the point you're making and to some extent we, we, we may be speaking slightly across purposes that um, given that um, the extent to which deprivation applies across Glasgow, uh, uh, albeit um, not in some areas, the reality is that if we are providing across the entire city then we are going to be reaching um, uh, uh, those significant areas of deprivation um, uh, that occur in Glasgow. Uh, I'm not in a position to, to say to you right now exactly what those figures are. I'm very, very happy um, um, if committee wishes that, that, that they are provided. Um, but I am confident um, that we uh, are reaching across the city uh, and throughout um, all of the income groups that, um, uh, that occur in the city. I suppose just the final point I would make is there's a difference between reach and uptake and that you would need to, even in a circumstance where there is no charging, I wonder if you have got strategies to increase uptake amongst families who maybe don't regard as something they can do or can afford, even if the, the council's not charging for it. I, I think the principal, I, I fully appreciate the point, I think the principal strategy that the, that the council has is to uh, ensure that the provision is made uh, across the entire estate and across uh, all of uh, the areas and all of the income groups in the city. But I appreciate the point you're making. And can I just ask finally the other panellists, what made them choose differently from Glasgow? I mean, everybody's got budget pressures. Why did you feel that it, would, it was reasonable ultimately to select music tuition rather than some other bit for your budget? Um, I think there are very few other bits of the budget that are not already under pressure. For the, uh, it would be the first thing I would say. Um, <clears throat> it was certainly not a, a choice we made lightly and not a choice that um, we were um, keen to make. Um, <clears throat> we looked at all the options available to us. The original proposal that uh, the administration brought forward in West Lothian 
was that we were going to maintain free tuition, but we were going to reduce the number of disciplines in which we offered free tuition. And I would still regard that as being a, a positive option because I think it avoids many of the issues that are related to uh, charging. I think uh, to your previous question, that even before we didn't reduce uh, charging, um, the access to instrumental music tuition was not um, taken up equally right across the board in terms of uh, <coughs> the, the uh, range of society. Uh, up to before we started charging, 12.75% of, of the people who accessed instrumental music tuition were in the most deprived uh, quintile as opposed to 28% in the uh, least deprived quintile. And we did on occasions look at... Um, uh, we had officers looking at one particular school in a, a deprived area and trying to bring up the uh, proportion of young people who did take up musical uh, tuition, but did prove very difficult. I'm not sure how you would do that, unless, of course, you prioritised your tutors into the areas of greatest deprivation, which then in turn would have the, uh, the, an impact in the areas where people were able to, uh, to afford it. So it was something that... Um, <clears throat> We were very reluctantly uh, forced to do. Our option would have, of course, have had consequences as well. It would have meant that children would not have been able to continue taking uh, forward musical tuition, but that would have, it would have meant that any child who wanted to take up musical tuition and had an aptitude to do so could have done so without having to consider the, the cost of it. So I think that my answer would be it's something we did very reluctantly and would not have done with any other option. I've got a number of members wanting to come in on the back of Joanne. Um, uh, can I first go to Ross Greer? A quick supplementaries at this stage, please. <laughs> Very quick. Um, just on this, uh, the, the point around cost and if not charging for uh, music tuition means cuts elsewhere, I, I'm interested in what the, the difference in cost between your local authorities is. Because as far as I'm aware, in Perth and Kinross, it's over £800 per pupil. Is there a quantity of, of uh, economies of scale thing going on here where the per pupil cost in Glasgow is lower because various logistical challenges in Glasgow like getting tutors between schools are lower than they would be in somewhere like Perth and Kinross? To a degree I think that's correct. Um, I, I'm glad you raised the issue about the rural aspect because um, Joanne Lamont correctly raised the issue about folk who are disadvantaged but we can have folk who, uh, pupils and parents who are disadvantaged because of transport, because of distance, um, because of the lack of transport and the, the and what we've been working hard with with, with all the voluntary organisations that support the, the instrumental music services, can you do car sharing? Can you get people to help each other out? Um, can there be a community aspect to that? Can we make sure there's a bus to take the bairns home at night um, after after the lessons or uh, are there other ways to, to provide that? So we, we have that additional challenge. Um, and we've also got the challenge of just travel, um, but we do provide buses um, and transport wherever we can to, for the central groups, for instance. Um, and we do have a sensitivity analysis. Um, for instance, the, the, our 20% increase this year was not popular. That's just a statement of fact. Um, however, we did review it and we looked at the music camp costs and we made sure that they weren't, weren't making a profit. The parents didn't want us to make a profit on that. Um, so we made sure that it simply covered the cost. We've adapted our um, um, policies to take account of that. And that's listening to the community and reacting to it. Um, I think the, the issue about why did we charge, we, we always have. Um, and we see, it's, as I said in my introductory remarks, really important to make sure the service and the quality of the service is maintained. The other kind of unique thing about Perth and Kinross, there are many unique things about Perth and Kinross, um, Karina, um, but um, one is that we're a rural area that supports and has two producing repertory theatres, um, which not only provides excellent facility, but also provides youngsters with opportunities um, to move into these areas to work because the, the link between the instrumental music service and opportunity to work in theatre um, is, is very strong. And we work with both of these theatres um, as part of our overall aspect to provide opportunities for young people. Um, so I, I think it's a difficult question to answer um, about charges, but we are where we are now with it. Okay.
Um, do the other members want to come in? Yes, Councillor um, Dodds. Um, I think, uh, as the papers, the background papers suggest, uh, none of the councils charge full recovery for the musical tuition. And I think the key figure is the difference between the amount of money that the council put in to musical tuition and the amount it costs to deliver. In our case, um, we were looking at a budget of £939,000, which was cut to £500,000. So the charge we introduced of £340,000 uh, was to uh, ensure that we recovered the difference between the two, while at the same time maintaining the level of um, musical tuition. So it's, and I think that's why there is such a, a patchwork across the country, and I think previous surveys have, have shown exactly that. Can I bring in Liz Smith? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Councillor Cunningham, just before I ask uh, another general question, could you just clarify a couple of things you said? Um, firstly, in your introductory remarks, you said that you took issue with some of the statistics that we had in our papers. Could you just say what that is? The, um, uh, the, the papers um, show that um, I think the um, um, instrumental music uh, tuition programme reaches 8% of Glasgow's pupils. Um, my officials had um, uh, some difficulty with that um, uh, and um, gave me figures which suggest that actually, as I said, it's 44%. I think it, it, I, I think it might be dependent on, on, on what's counted and what's not counted. Uh, it's possible that the 8% the figure refers only to uh, secondary schools, I'm not sure. Um, I, I genuinely don't know what is um, where the figures that is in your papers come from, um, uh, but my officials are, are, are clear that the, the reach is far, far greater. And if we're in more than 100 primary schools uh, and all of our secondaries, um, I struggle to see how the, you could um, uh, reduce that down to 8%. Thank you. I think, Convener, it might be worth checking that discrepancy because it's quite considerable. Um, the, the other point, uh, Councillor Cunningham, um, you, you mentioned that Glasgow previously had charged and that the decision was reversed, but it took some time to build it back up again. Uh, how long did that take, roughly, do you know? Uh, my, my understanding from officials was that the charging was introduced around 10 years ago, um, uh, but uh, quite quickly was reversed. Um, um, uh, don't ask me for a, a timeline on, on uh, how long it took to... Uh, from their perspective, build it back up again. But that, that message came across to me uh, fairly clearly when I was uh, discussing it with officials. Uh, I, I think the, the big issue there, and it's probably a general point, uh, is that um, there is a, a huge step between not charging and charging something, yeah. uh, which I think is a far, far greater step than, for argument's sake, charging £100 and increasing it to £110. Um, um, incremental increases in charges are one thing, but that, that big step of do you introduce charges or not um, that seems to me to be the significant one, and it's that, that issue that caused the problem about, um, about around 10 years ago um, and that the Council stepped back from. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dodds, could I ask, I mean, obviously you've taken the decision to uh, charge. Um, what, what are the latest statistics um, from uh, West Lothian as to how many uh, youngsters have had to drop out? Um, and we don't have the final figures as yet. We are waiting for some of the figures, but I can give you a general idea that um, the number of primary students since we introduced charging has decreased from uh, 1,128 in November of last year to 234 this year. One in five students at primary level have opted to continue. At secondary level, the number of students has decreased from 1,042 in November 17 to 514 uh, in November this year. Uh, so only half of our young people have continued. An estimated uh, 264 primary and, and 53 secondary students sorry, have uh, shown an interest in entering the service. Uh, and we are hoping that um, up to 49% of them may opt to take up musical tradition. And, and do you have these statistics because of, um, obviously, the, um, you're having to bill people uh, for the fees that you're charging? Is that, is that where the statistical evidence has come from? Or the evidence is, is coming from the returns from parents who have, have in, ex expressed an interest in continuing and obviously from uh, our tutors on the ground who are able to tell us accurately how many young people are continuing in each of their schools. Okay. Uh, and my final point to uh, both Councillor Dodds and Councillor Wilson, if I may, um, we're obviously very concerned about the drop-off in 
uh, youngsters uh, as a result of the fee charges. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in what councils are doing to provide a sort of cost-benefit analysis of, of exactly where you stand, because obviously there are a large number of youngsters who are not getting uh, the, or not able to uptake the uh, offer, um, as might have been uh, previously the case. Um, what, what analysis are you doing of this in terms of uh, getting provision to those who are most in need and, and addressing the concerns for those youngsters who have had to drop out? Um, what, what are you doing to make an assessment of this situation? Uh, well, uh, I think in our case, the statistics are only becoming available, so I think we'll have to look at that going forward. That, um, uh, what I can say is that the, uh, the, the drop-off follows very closely the SIMD uh, profile of the schools, and that the drop-off is much more pronounced in schools in more deprived areas. So we will certainly have uh, to look at how we respond to that. Um, <clears throat> we introduced uh, what I think are very common range of uh, discounts that nobody who is doing SQA pays for tuition. We have a sibling discount of 50% and families who uh, <clears throat> have um, receipt of free school meals uh, don't pay at all. But interestingly enough, there's been a drop off even there from 10% uh, of the total to around 6% of the total. And are you looking at why? Uh, we will look at why. Uh, I think at the moment you could speculate, but I think we will look at why. I think the part of the, the, the problem uh, it remains that uh, although we've introduced a, a standard charge, it may be an equal charge, but it's not an equitable charge. In some cases, that, uh, that charge will be met from uh, by families who have a, a reasonable amount of disposable income and who are able to meet that charge and sibling charge. In other cases, I think the families who are facing that charge are looking at trying to find money after they've paid for the basics like heating, food and clothing, uh, and everything else that they have left is every penny is accounted for. So for us to bring in a, a charge, any charge, is going to be a great challenge to that, and I think we'll have to look at how we respond to that. Obviously, these figures aren't complete, but on the basis of what we have already, we're going to have to look at... a. a Response Sorry. across the board. I think. Can, can I can I just take convener? Why why are the figures not complete as yet? Uh, probably the main reason is that when we introduced uh, charging, we had to move from just uh, asking young people if they wanted to take it up, and then we did. We were one of the authorities who did an assessment, and then if the children were suitable, they just continued. Uh, in fairness, now that we've introduced charging, we've given, introduced a four-week period when children can have an option to try out the musical tuition and decide if it's for them before they charge. And I think that period is just about to come to a close. Right. So the figures are, are, are fair. I think the, those, the figures I've given you will be fairly robust. There may be some changes uh, uh, in the new update. Can we just clarify that these are the figures that have come back or are coming back to um, the, the full analysis of all 32 local authorities that's currently being done? These are our figures. These are West Lothian figures for the charges we've introduced. Which are being sent back to the general survey that's being done, is that correct? They will be. Right, okay. Just to follow on from that, first of all, as I said earlier, we, we've seen no drop-off in the applications um, uh, this year. Um, we, because the, the music tuition year doesn't coincide with the financial year, there's a lag time in getting the statistics and we're only gathering them in finally now. Um, but as, a, as, of, as of this week, we saw no major drop off. I think to answer the second part of, of, of your question about, well, if there were, what are you going to do about it? Um, the bursary scheme is one um, where it, it's, it's open ended to begin with. And, and there's obviously um, we, we're, we're looking at qualifications, but we're, we're, we're fairly flexible about these as things stand at the moment. The second thing is we, we want to work even harder with our parent groups to see how, how we can help. And examples I gave about car sharing and transport are, are there and there, there's other, other initiatives. We are looking at the purchase of additional instruments as one option if there were any um, gaps in that, that, that process. Um, we'll get advice from our professionals on that. One of the concerns we have is that people who are at the margins, there are folk who will qualify for discounts for a variety of reasons, but somebody who's just over that may be disadvantaged. And we want to, I think, work harder with the parental groups to look at these people who might be disadvantaged or, or disincentivized to participate in, because that, that's sometimes the folk that are hit the hardest. Um, and 
if, if you add on the, the question of rural transport costs, that can be a, a, a big issue. So these are some of the things that we're, we're working at at the moment to try and minimise the effect. None of this is done with any pleasure convener, I can assure you. Um, and it, it's, it, it was done to protect the service and make sure the service was available um, in the future, because if we'd, if we'd taken chunks out of the service, then that would have been seriously bad for, for everybody. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Gray, did you want to? <coughs> I, was, I, I think the committee are uh, probably sensitive to the really difficult decisions that councils have had to take in this. So, Perth and Ken Ross have had to raise their charges by 20 per cent. That's a pretty swinging increase, West Lothian going from not charging to charging. Um, that was difficult. Um, I know in East Lothian, where I am, they introduced charging for the first time and suffered quite a lot of grief publicly because of that. And even Glasgow, maybe more historically, has tried to introduce charges and then had to pull back from them. Um, we, we, the committee have looked at other models elsewhere, and in Wales there's a recommendation um, that music services be delivered nationally through an arm's length body. Would that not be a simpler solution here, which would prevent your authorities having to take these very difficult decisions? Um, can I uh, just make the point that, um, uh, yes, it would relieve the local authority of having to make that <coughs> decision, but it would simply place that decision, difficult or otherwise, in somebody else's hands, um, and it would then create a situation in which, uh, whatever that decision was, uh, there would be some that were happy with it and some that were unhappy with it. Um, uh, I don't think it resolves the issue um, uh, of um, whether or not music tuition should be um, should be free or can be free in its delivery. I think it just shifts the decision making. Local authorities might uh, might at that point go, well, that's absolutely fine. You make the decision, uh, whoever you are, um, uh, the national body. But it, it doesn't alter the, the the nature and character of that decision. Well, it would, sorry, Councillor Wilson. I I think it would be worse, and I think it would be one size fits all. Scotland's a diverse country, as we all know. And the answers for Shetland, Perth and Gernos, Glasgow, wherever, are different. Um, it would remove any local control or influence. It would certainly diminish substantially parental involvement. And that's absolutely crucial as far as our IMS is concerned in Perth and Gernos. And I think that it would be a major disadvantage. It would shift the problem. But I think it would increase the problem, and I think you would then have the likelihood of um, some of the signing up to IMS falling off a cliff, to be quite blunt. Yeah, um, I, I tend to agree. I think that um, I don't think there's a, an issue with the, the decision making regarding uh, music choice at local level. I think it is a question of competition for funding. If you move it to a national level, it will compete with other funds, possibly. And I think at local level as well, uh, the instrumental music tuition reflects the musical heritage of the local area. Is that in uh, our own area, we have a strong mining tradition and a strong bass band tradition, and that's reflected in the fact that brass is our biggest uh, <coughs> discipline. And I think there are other areas where that might be piping, or it might be strings, or it might be tr Scottish traditional music. And I think local authorities are perfectly placed to reflect that and to provide a service that responds to that. And I think that would be lost if it was to be moved to a national service. So I'm generally in favour of, of local decision making around local services. But the fact of the matter is that the result of that that we see is that in Glasgow, instrumental tuition is provided free, whereas, I haven't got the figure in front of me, but I think in one local authority, the cost of parent and family is over £500 a year. Are, I, I mean, I don't know, Councillor Wilson, are you suggesting that's because parents in Clackman and Shire want to pay £500 a year, but parents in Glasgow don't want to? Can, can, can we really sustain such a wide, huge disparity in the provision? I'm not sure if I can answer for Clackman and Shire no. or, or, or Glasgow, to be honest. Um, I, well, your own is... Well, yes, I understand the point fully. Right? Yeah. I, I, I think the problem... For us, it isn't such a big problem because 
there have always been charges and folk have got used to that and if you've got used to it over a period of time um, then th there's ways you can budget for things. But, but my point is, are you saying your parents have always wanted to pay for instrumental tuition and you're responding to their local desire then? I don't know if I would accuse them of always wanted to pay, right. um, but I think what we have developed is a partnership arrangement where it's become the norm. Um, as I said earlier, the increase, the 20% increase, and you used the word swinging, I said it was substantial, substantial. Um, yeah, no. was not popular. Um, and it's something that we're working on at the moment. We're, we're, we're looking at and looking at, obviously looking very closely at the, the detailed effects of it. But um, if, 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 if we hadn't done that, if we'd, if we'd cut the service, I think that would have been e even worse. And I think there's a disparity because there always will be. Why would we worry about a variety of solutions? That's what democracy is about. That's what local government's about. That's what the variety of Scotland's about. I agree with you that it it seems strange that some places, but, but councils make decisions. They make choices. Glasgow's made a choice, which I don't criticise. I, I, I think that's fine. And I think um, it's important that councils work with communities to try and sustain and maintain what we've got. So, I mean... I I think the point's fair, but the disparity is very wide. And Councillor Dodds, in, in your presentation, I think you made it fairly clear that you introduced charging not because you felt that was the right thing for your local area or because parents wanted to make that contribution. You did it because you absolutely had to. Is that, is that I, I think that's a fair reflection. So it's not really responding to, to local needs and desires, is it? It's responding to the budget. Uh, it's it's, it's budget-driven. Um, you could argue in our case that it was uh, responding to local um, <clears throat> desire because it was a very active campaign for us to introduce charging. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think for reasons we've already discussed, um, there will always be disparities because councils have to make decisions based on different factors. Um, the, the only equitable solution that we could achieve is that if a child has the desire and the, the aptitude, then that uh, provision is available free of charge. If, unless that's the situation, it will never be equitable. There will always be differences. And as I think I've uh, suggested earlier, even if you introduced a standard national charge, that would mean very different things for different families and make it very difficult for families to be able to take up, uh, allow their children to take up music if that's what they want to do. Could I possibly just add, add uh, another thing, and that is that, that there is an issue about uh, whether or not there is an entitlement in law uh, and whether or not there is charging. Um, uh, if, you, um, if you somehow or other say that there is an entitlement in law, that that, that is a road that uh, has got some significant issues in it. But if you, if you do that, um, um, uh, uh, then you've got the question of how it's funded. If you say that there is a... Um, uh, that it's going to be funded um, um, and it's going to be free, um, but there isn't an entitlement, uh, then what happens presumably is that um, uh, uh, budgets get squeezed around the extent of the provision, albeit it's free. Um, uh, and so the, the, the extent of the provision gets squeezed rather than um, the, the pricing uh, gets increased. Um, to some extent, I, I don't have a a simple answer to, to those things, but it just strikes me that, that it's one or the other. So in that, we had a debate recently about um, national testing, and in the course of that, the Cabinet Secretary for Education made the point that there is no statutory requirement for you as local authorities to teach literacy and numeracy in schools, and yet those subjects are taught in every school, and the idea that a local authority would decide they weren't going to teach it or indeed they were going to charge for that is quite ludicrous. Why is music different? I, I, you know, I, I don't have an answer to why music is necessarily different because we don't treat it uh, as, as being different. Um, but you're absolutely right that there is very, very little uh, enshrined in law as to what uh, uh, must be taught in our schools. I think it's religious education from the 1980 Act uh, that is the only uh, uh, subject that's uh, uh, prescribed. Um, uh, and I think the difficulty is if you if you put music in on that standing, um, uh, you you do create a difficulty with all of the other subjects that are that are there in our curriculum through guidance, um, uh, but not through um, not not through statute. 
Uh, and I think, uh, you know, um, I, to some extent, I'd probably say there be demons in, in going down the road of, do you put um, one subject in law and others not? But that's your decision. Yeah, um, I think the, the place of music in uh, the school curriculum is, is secure. And I know in West Lothian, and I'm sure in the other authorities, uh, it is a core part of the curriculum for excellence, and it's delivered in school by music staff. And young, uh, the children in the schools have the opportunity to, to learn music and access to musical instruments, both in uh, the, the, the classroom and through the Youth Music Initiative in primary school. But that's slightly different to the instrumental music provision, which is discretionary, I think, and something that councils look to provide in the, the, the best way that they possibly can. So there is, a, a, I think, a slight difference, but music is still very much part of the curriculum. Access to musical instruments is, is part of what we do in our schools uh, and would continue to do. So I don't think there's any threat to the place of music in education. Okay, I have a number of members have indicated they want a supplementary. So if it is a supplementary and what's been heard, Mr. Scott, do you want to go just now? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if, so it's not the Wales model that uh, Ian Gray has just asked you about. Uh, is your argument, and, and Councillor Dodds was quite notable on this in, in, in his introductory remarks, is your argument, therefore, that uh, central government and Scottish government should uh, ring fence money for music. If it's not to be a not to be a central service, one of the alternatives that could be considered would be a central fund, which I guess either on a formula-based system or on a on a bid system, local government would seek to access. Is that any better? Uh, 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 no, I think uh, the uh, general funding level of local authorities needs to be increased because that's where the problem comes from. If you ring fence uh, music tuition and say there's a sum of uh, money set aside for instrumental tuition without a general increase in funding, you're, uh, what you're actually doing is taking money away from another area and diverting it to uh, instrumental music tuition. So you may solve that problem, but um, it's going to be at the expense of the, uh, the finance available in either other areas of education or uh, other areas of local authority function. Um, which I don't think does solve the problem. It, Fair it's, it's music is part of what you deliver in schools, and why should it be separate in financial terms? Would be the argument that would be my it. argument. That yeah. if, uh, what we need is adequate funding to provide the services that we we would like to fund for our local communities. Sure. Yeah. I, I I think that it might be a worse solution. We've got to the moment. Uh, again, the centralisation versus um, delegation devolution argument applies, but I repeat again, convener, um, the, the point about parental involvement in this whole process, I think if there's any centralised funding or control over it, uh, uh, that will that could vanish overnight, and that, that that's something that there's a great value. It's difficult to put a money tag on that, um, and I also think that it, it would mean some other part of the national budget would need to be there, and it would remove local democratic control, because if you had to apply in you got X, there wouldn't be any flexibility in that X amount. It would be simply decided centrally according to a formula. And I think sometimes local authorities have enough problems with the formulas that we have already. We need adequate funding for our core services. And we look upon music as a core service. OK, uh, that's entirely fair and straightforward. And therefore, as a consequence of that, do you think there's a greater onus on local government, local authorities, um, as you represent here today, to take into account the questions that Joanne Lamont was asking about children who come from um, uh, families where there is no money and therefore just cannot access any sense of children. No matter what you do, it, we'll just find it much more difficult to do. Do you think your analysis of, of those families, because I always worry about SIMD, to be honest, because it's very broad and you need to get down to a, an individual family level to understand that. Do you think you need to do more on your analysis that you very helpfully illustrated earlier on about how to identify children who could and should have an opportunity to take up music, uh, but just there's no money at home and mum and dad can't afford to put them anywhere near it. Yes, and poverty is interesting because it's sometimes not money. It's sometimes yep. about time. It's sometimes about to. access. It's sometimes about transport. I've, I've made that point before, but um, I, I think it's really important that we help families. Um, and it's part, if you look at the, the whole aspect of, of education and what we're trying to do with young children young persons, families, and, and school pupils. It's part of that whole process of how we support the family. 
And if we don't do it holistically, then I think there's a danger in siloization, if I can use that dreadful phrase, um, that we, we, we pick something differently. So Joanne Lamont was absolutely spot on with her question about how can we, how can we include people. I mentioned the people who are at the margins who I worry about more in some ways than, than, than others because they fall out with the, the support mechanism. And what we're trying to do through our bursary scheme and, and working with parents, as I mentioned earlier, is, 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 is to start to dig a bit deeper into that problem, at least as far as Perth and Conross is concerned, and see how we can help. Can I just... Uh, um, I don't want to in introduce a discordant note here, but um, the reality is that poverty is always about money. Um, the rest are consequences, um, whether it be um, uh, distance, travel, or, or whatever. Um, uh, all of those become barriers where there is a lack of resources. Uh, poverty is always about money. Hey, Councillor Dodson. Yeah, I would just in, in, endorse that. I think that's exactly right. Poverty is always about money and everything else is a consequence of money. The other thing and, and is that we have different uh, demographics, but uh, in West Lothian we're not talking about the margins. And I think there's a danger here in, in conceptualising that, that uh, people who are in the high SIMD uh, areas and on quintile one uh, are the only ones who are, are struggling. I think this the, <clears throat> the ability to find additional money for anything, including instrumental music tuition, is something that uh, affects families uh, uh, well up the, uh, the income scale, and it becomes very difficult. As I say, uh, in uh, families where one parent is in employment or both parents are in employment and will pay. Uh, every penny's a prisoner, as the saying used to be, that uh, everything is accounted for. And we can only help if we look at it from that point of view. Bursaries can only, I think, help, as has been suggested, at the margins. They're not a solution for the problem that's facing us in West Lothian. Okay. Dr Allen, you want to... Yeah, you. Just uh, picking up on, on one of the points that um, Councillor Dodds was making about SQA exams and about the... The commitment. I think that most authorities have to try to ensure that um, fees don't prevent people from accessing SQ exams. We, we met with uh, Royal Conservatory our students in, in music last week, and, and they were they were raising, a, I suppose, a question about that, that issue, which is um, if the if the assumption is that we don't charge for tuition leading up to SQ exams, how is leading up to defined, and what advantages do people? have or disadvantages that people have if they've not had access to music tuition when it comes to doing SQA exams in music? I, I think it's inevitable that um, uh, if you've not got some background um, before you uh, reach um, the, the formal music subject, you're going, you're going to be struggling. Uh, I realise that it's presentation at SQA level that requires the, the, the competence um, in, in instruments, um, but um, uh, you're, you're not going to choose the subject um, uh, unless you've already got an interest, and, and uh, it, it's, it's the responsibility to some extent, you know, further down the, uh, the, the, the school ladder uh, to foster that interest. Um, uh, uh, so it's inevitable that uh, if, if that's not already developed, then uh, it's going to impact on the number of of pupils that are choosing music as a, an SQA subject. I think that's a perfectly fair point, um, and it's a difficult one, to be quite honest. Um, obviously, the pupils studying for full SQA courses in S4 to 6, are, in Perth and Ross anyway, are offered, offered um, free tuition. But it, what the point you're making is, what about the lead up? How do you get, how do you get to S4? Um, and and that, that is really difficult. Um, I think just generally budgets having been squeezed so tight um, in, in the last few years have made um, some local authorities, including our own, draw back from, from it. And I would like personally to reverse that, but I, I don't have a pot of gold to, to pay for it. And we get into the very difficult situation of what else in education. Um, in the education budget, can you start to find savings? And because approximately, um, Two thirds of the budget is is ring fence, um, and and that leaves you with savings in, in the one third package, which makes it even harder. Um, so what we would like to do and what we we can do 
are, are two different things, I'm afraid. Um, we have to live in the real world and, and try and do our best. But um, I think through a variety of means, we, we try to support as many people as possible. But we, we, we can only do what we can do. So yeah, um, I think we have the same concession. We begin the concession at the beginning of S4, and it would continue until S6. And uh, the other, uh, my colleagues here have outlined the issues there quite uh, <clears throat> clearly. I think what we, uh, before we introduce charging, uh, the correlation between uh, pupils doing SQA and doing um, musical tuition wasn't that high. There were some pupils who were using their instrument in uh, uh, curriculum music, but not a huge amount of them. Um, having uh, <clears throat> gone forward, 19.19%, 19 I think, of our secondary pupils uh, are now uh, qualifying for the discount. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are now, uh, this year certainly, pupils in our schools who are choosing to do music curricula as a way of preserving their instrumental music, because it's the only way they can afford it. Okay, I've got a couple of supplementaries still. Uh, Mr MacDonald? Thanks very much. It was a point you raised, uh, Councillor Dodds, earlier on um, about uh, charging. I think it was in response to, to Ian Gray's questions. My understanding is that West Lothian Council carried out a survey of the 1,800 uh, parents who had children that were uh, undertaking music tuition, and you gave them four options. Can you tell us what the outcome of that survey was? Yes, I can. Um, if you can find the, the figures in front of me. We offered four options, which included um, three... Uh, <clears throat> options in, uh, where tuition would remain free, but on different models, reducing, st uh, removing strings or reducing, and one of charging. Of the uh, the surveys that we sent out, um, the response was less than uh, fifty percent. And although there was a majority, a small majority of fifty percent of those responding who were in favour of introducing charging. In terms of the families who were in receipt of instrumental music tuition at that time, it was just slightly over 19% of the total. But it was every single catchment area um, of the 11 secondary school catchment areas, that of those who returned, voted in favour of um, introducing some form of charging. Uh, I would need to come back to you on that. Um, I think um, there was a clear preference from charging in one particular school area. Um, the, the numbers I've got in front of me is quite substantially every single school has a majority in favour right, okay. of charging. Then if you have that in front of you, I can't find the figure to hand at the moment. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, Ms Mackay? Yeah, just um, still on, on budgets. Um, Councillor Dodds, you started charging this year for the first time. Do you see that now as the trajectory and, and you know, will um, charging be part of your budget discussions in, in ongoing years, in your opinion? Uh, I think given the uh, levels of drop-off, we will have to uh, address that. that um, we, are at, we are now at the margins of being able to continue to provide a viable instrumental music tuition service. So uh, we've, for example, gone down from 13 bands and ensembles to a total at the moment of five, and we're looking at ways of delivering ensemble uh, provision in other forms for other uh, disciplines. So I, I think it is something that, uh, as a council, we will have to address again. Uh, perhaps our experience will have to be a reflection of uh, the Glasgow experience. What I'm really getting at is it's not set in stone. What I'm th saying is you, you will consider uh, whether you can return to free tuition in future budget discussions. Uh, I, I think inevitably, I think uh, when we um, <clears throat> set our level of charging, uh, we had assumed a maximum level of uh, dropping off of 30%, but in fact the retention level is closer to 30%. So based on that, um, what we're now offering uh, doesn't achieve what we set out to achieve. So we would need to look at that, and that would need to include looking at returning to some kind of form of free provision. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson, can I just ask you if you could maybe clarify a wee bit how your bursary um, scheme works? How does it... Well, this is year one, so we're, we're, we're in a learning phase with yeah. it. Um, we've asked for applications from anyone, parents, any, any parents who feel there's financial pressure on. Um, and we've had a, 
uh, not a huge flood of applications so far, but um, it, was, it was only launched early in October, so we're, we're fairly early doors yet um, with it. But um, it, once we are able to look at the applications, we'll find out who would qualify, um, for instance, under under any of the, 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 the as I say, the normal headings of, 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 of free tuition. Um, and these are some of the some of the benchmarks for it. But there may well be other people who we would want to try and help. Um, and that's where we're we're going to have a, a look at when we see the, the the analysis, and I'm hoping to get this by the end of this month of the applications, how we how we may go on to to help people in other ways. Um, uh, that's subject to some fairly delicate discussions with a, a variety of players at the moment. Um, I, I, I don't mean to be secretive about it, but um, we 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 will be. Excuse me. Are you setting the parameters for that in terms of income threshold, that kind of thing? And we 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 will set. We will set certain basic parameters, yes, but it may be that we'll look at, at some of um, the, the parental support groups to see how, how that might be um, enhanced. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. It leads on to a supplementary that I wanted to ask uh, myself. Um, we mentioned that we had the graduate year from the Royal Conservative Wire of Scotland, who are, uh, the B. Ed, who are studying to be music teachers. And um, two, two of the, the members in the group that I was dealing with had come through the Glasgow system, and both of which, um, it's, it's really a question of the sustainability of the service going forward, and that all of them said that they'd had to seek outside support to achieve the grades to get into the conservatoire. But two of the, um, the young people who were there had said that they had um, not only received support from Glasgow City Council, but they'd been given grants to um, attend the Conservatoire Juniors and that had been given additional support and I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper on Ms Mackay's questions about it, the purpose of the grants. Is it to help people financially or is it to support um, potential and you know the, the, the talent of the young people so that they can achieve their full potential in this area? I say to you that that's an area that I'm, um, uh, I'm not on firm ground and I'm not going to um, uh, uh, go there um, uh, and make a mistake on it. Um, uh, it. Is it about the financial circumstances on the individuals, or is it about um, um, uh, their their aptitude uh, and their their talent? Um, I, I can't answer that. I can find out, but I can't answer that. Okay. If you could provide us with that information afterwards, that would be very helpful, Councillor Cunningham, uh, Councillor Wilson. I'm happy to provide a more detailed answer, but we have a variety of opportunities for young people. Um, who, who are in a similar situation, whether it be the Conservatoire or in, in Glasgow or elsewhere, um, to apply to the Council for assistance. That can be done through a number of ways. Um, there's a straightforward um, uh, financial assistance programmes. We have common good funds that can sometimes help people. Um, and, and, and we also have a, a variety of other local funding um, arrangements that might apply. And we also have a, a, an educational trust. It's one of these very old-fashioned things that somebody left money um, uh, X years ago, and we're, we're, we're trying to modernise that process so we can make, make, it, make it worthwhile and help people. So there are a variety of different methods. I, these are three examples. I need to give you a bit more detail in, in the post. Um, I've got a couple of other supplementaries. Ms. Goldruth, you wanted to come in on that point. Thank you, too. Convener. Um, it's just a brief supplementary with regard to fee exemptions, um, because I know PKC offer fee exemptions in terms of income based concessions and a sibling discount, and West Lothian offer it for people in receipt of free school meals looked after children and those obviously studying towards an SQA qualification. How do you communicate that fee exemption opportunity to parents and carers and to pupils throughout their educational journey? I mean, are they told at a certain point in time that they might be able to apply for it? How does that happen? Yes, I mean, we, we, we regularly uh, publicise it, first of all, on the council website, etc. But we also write proactively to, to parents, um, outlining the, the opportunities there are. And we, again, working through school parent councils, through head teachers, um, and, and through other methods of communication with parents, then that, that information is widely available. We have only got experience from one year. Um, and what we did was write to every family in receipt of instrumental music tuition, outlining all of the options available. We also offer a sibling discount. And what about the families who were not in receipt of music tuition? Did you um, the, the, the situation would be that um, when the offer was made to young people if they wanted to take the instruments up, 
then uh, that information will be communicated at that stage. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Mandel. Question, convener. So, if other people have got main questions, I'm happy to. Well, we're about to move away. on, so you've got up here. Okay. On you go. <laughs> uh, thank you. It was on a slightly uh, different uh, topic last week. Uh, we heard uh, from a couple of panelists that they felt that instrumental uh, music teachers were treated uh, differently from other teaching staff, and that limited sort of how effective a role they could play, um, and also some some issues around sort of ret retaining their skills. Um, and talents within our schools. Is that something that you've come across as, as, as local authorities in difficulty in finding the right people and, and keeping them? Thank you for the question. I'm not sure as to what's different. Um, we treat our instrumental music staff according to the conditions of service and that will apply to all members of, 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 of staff within the council. Um, I, but diff what, different what to other different? teaching staff. So, you know, we're, we're people who are uh, routinely you are taking part in classroom and curriculum teaching. You are valued differently. They have different roles within their schools, whereas instrumental teachers are sort of seen as being a sort of add-on, or you know, not you know, not not given the same status or importance. I certainly think they're not an add-on. We don't treat our instrumental music staff in that way at all. We value their contribution very much, um, and uh, recognise that. And I would be astonished if I discovered that any member of staff had been treated differently. Um, they have a different role, and they, they many, and because again of rural distance, they've got a peripatetic role, and they may spend more time in a, a car going from A to B than we would want them to do. But they might be teaching, but that's life if, if you've got a big rural area. Um, they, they certainly are, 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 are not uh, in any way, as far as I know treated any differently and in fact we we do spend a lot of time speaking to our um, uh, leader uh, in the instrumental music service through through the senior officers and we we get fairly vigorous feedback from them on a regular basis um, which is good and i i don't know of any reason to treat them any differently they, they certainly are not as far as person can is concerned and I don't, <clears throat> I don't think we treat ours differently in the sense that you're, you're suggesting. They are certainly managed, obviously, because um, they uh, have a different role uh, and they work in close collaboration with the music departments in the schools in which they work. Um, and I think my view is that they are highly valued within those departments and they, uh, their contribution is seen as, as very important. They do do a different job and for that reason there are differences in the way uh, that they're managed, but other than that, no. Uh, I'd echo that. Um, I think that um, our, our music tutors are uh, as valued as uh, any other staff, but, um, but uh, yes, the, 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 the role and character of what they do is inevitably different. Um, but are they, are they less valued? No. And are, are, just as, I mean, are you finding that there's difficulty or are you finding it easy to retain people with the right skills? You know, with of, with the right range of you know of, of instrumental provision, um, you know, or, or is it getting more difficult to attract people uh, to to provide instrumental music tuition? I wouldn't say that we have any experience of it be, becoming more difficult. And is that the same for the two other authorities? I'm not sure I can answer that with any authority. I'm not aware of any difficulty in recruiting or retraining music instructors. Uh, that has certainly hasn't been reported to me. We have no major difficulties in that regard. In fact, a number of our teachers and instrumental music specialists have been with us for many years. Okay. Yes, Ms. Bloodlong. I'm, I'm quite interested in your response to that because clearly it may be worth looking at the evidence from last week because I think there's a very strong feeling um, in the other direction. They weren't regarded as core business and therefore perhaps expendable in some ways or, or they had to be flexible in the way that other staff wouldn't. I wonder if you think, I mean, for all local authorities, the figures we have, I think the number of music tutors is down by about 50%. We have a graph, a very significant reduction. Does that mean that even where um, we're not charging, the actual number of tutors that are available to local authorities is reducing? And has that an impact? I think some of the evidence we've got talks about a tipping point in relation to the service, and I wonder if you think we're anywhere near that? The, um, the figures that we provided will indicate that um, 
in terms of our youth music initiative, there has been a drop in the number of tutors. It's not a, it's not a dramatic drop, but there has been a drop. Um, uh, and that reflects um, uh, budgetary pressures. Um, uh, uh, local authorities have to make those decisions. Um, um, within the, you know, their, their budgetary constraints. Can I just ask then, do you agree with your, your, your two colleagues in the panel that actually there's an issue about the resourcing of local government and we should, that Glasgow requires a, a greater budget in order not to have to make these choices? I, I'm never going to turn money away. Would um, you ask for and, it though? Which uh, would be, is and, a separate and, and, and the answer is yes. Um, uh, uh, local government has um, uh, experienced uh, a greater level of, of budgetary uh, cut uh, than, uh, than uh, many other programs, many other areas of, of, um, uh, of budget. Um, yes, I would be very, very pleased to see uh, more resources coming uh, to the city um, uh, that we can spend on the programs that we think are important. Absolutely. Okay. On the question of the tipping point, the other Yep. Um, I think for us, obviously, the game changer has been the introduction of, of, of um, charging. Um, our intention was to retain the service, but with the reductions in numbers, we certainly wouldn't be able to retain the full range of instructors that we currently employ. Uh, so we will obviously have to address that. But I think that um, it, the, the whole economic situation and the, uh, <coughs> the need to to charge is going to have a, a, a negative impact on tutors. Can I ask, it's really following on the point from my colleague Rona Mackay then, that you would not, um, I mean, the, the logic of the drop is you reduce the number of tutors. Have you given yourself the space to make a different decision so you're not um, getting rid of tutors until you're absolutely sure that you're, mm. you're going to address the, question, the consequences of charging, which has been a reduced service? <clears throat> uh, I think the, the, sorry to interrupt, but the worry is, a vicious circle starts yeah, yeah, playing out, and, the, and it's actually difficult to stop it because. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely right. I think um, the Glasgow. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I think the Glasgow experience, uh, as described earlier, reflects that that having decided to introduce charging, and then reverse that, it took many years to get it back to uh, its previous level. And I think that's right. We built into our decision in May that a report on the. Uh, the situation would be brought to the education executive at the beginning of next year. And I would think that that would be uh, where we would need to look at the, uh, the consequences of charging as they have actually happened rather than as we anticipated they would and how we would address that issue. Okay. And that would involve looking at um, <coughs> what, how we deal with our instrumental music tutors, yes. Okay, thank you. I don't share the view at all that we, we certainly in Perth Cross are anywhere near any tipping point. Um, one, one of the main reasons for us in, in increasing the fees was to keep up the, the, the quality and the amount of IMS that we, we provided and delivered. And that was quite, quite clear. In the previous council term, um, there were savings made in the IMS budget staff efficiency of, of nearly 20k over that, over that five year period. Um, I lost the vote on that one. If it, won the vote, it might have been something different. Um, however, that was a council decision of the time and I was in a different different role. Um, uh, so um, there, there has been very small efficiency savings. That wasn't all staffing, I might add, it was something to do with travel and other costs uh, were, were included in that, in that figure. I don't think we're anywhere, as far as we're concerned, near a tipping point. I look upon the future with, 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 with great hope and great excitement because I think we've we, we, we're, we're full steam ahead and we want to keep going. Definitions of quality around the size of the group that's been taught, the reduction in one-to-one -one tuition, reduction in number of, um, and we've had some of this earlier, but the access to instruments, um, and the, or the, the length of time that a lesson might take. Is that closely monitored? Uh, that's a good point, yes. And, and sometimes there are choices have to be made about how many, it depends how many youngsters are, wanting to pursue a particular instrument. One-to-one -one tuition's great, but it's not always uh, deliverable in terms of uh, the number of people who want to participate, for instance. If, you, you, if you've got six youngsters who want to do 
one instrument, then you've got a certain amount of time to do that. And, and I, I think the small group work actually is good. We, there's a lot of evidence that you've heard about the benefits of working in a team. and Well, working in a small team and practising in a small team can have that benefit as well. Um, I don't think there's any major diminution in, in the quality as a result of small group work. And sometimes that's what we need to do to make sure that we, we, we have... There's a big demand, there's more demand for instrumental music tuition and service that we can supply. And we, we'll, we'll have a filtering system, as you're probably aware of, of, of testing youngsters to see if they've got the basic abilities, first of all. But there's more people applying than we could take on. So therefore, we have to look at a number of different solutions to making sure that we, we deliver the service. And small group work is, is one of them. And you would never be in a situation where <clears throat> a young person would find it cheaper to go to a private tutor where they would get one-to-one -one rather than be charged for being part of a group? I, I have anecdotal evidence that one or two people have said that they could go to a private tutor, um, but I've, I've, no, I've no formal evidence to, to, to that regard. And I think what we charge at the moment is still quite competitive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Goldruch? Councillor Wilson to a point you made, I think, with regard to recruitment, and you said there had not been any issues in that field. Is that, is that what you said? I, I am unaware of any difficulty in recruiting okay. staff to the instrumental music service. I wonder, therefore, then, why it's the case that Perth and King Ross has, I think, one of the lowest rates of um, pupil ratio to uh, music tutors. So I think one full-time equivalent music tutor for every 578 students in the country. I mean, that's less than half the national average. Why is that the case, then? Well, it, it, it is what it is. Um, it, it's, it's a figure that's taken per students. It doesn't mean that that's the relationship between the number of tutors and the number of people who are doing the instrumental music, uh, participating in the inst instrumental music service. I don't have that figure uh, off right. the top of my head. Um, uh, we, we, we do provide a quality service, and I, I don't think that figure is terribly helpful in, 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 in quoting because I don't think it adds anything to the discussion, to be quite honest. It's interesting to note, obviously, because you're employing less staff, so therefore you'd think you'd have more money in the budget to uh, spend, and perhaps it's the case, obviously, that Glasgow have, I think, double the amount of uh, music tutors per pupils, so therefore, but they're able to provide the service for free. Well, again, we're back to local decision making and, um, and how that how that pans out and, and local budgets. And there there is a, a mixed economy in this. I think we've all um, made that quite clear, but. Um, I, I don't think our instrumental music service is, uh, is diminished in any way by, by, by the, the number of tutors that we've got. Um, we could um, have more, we can always have more, but we, we work with the, the budget constraints that, that we've got and we've tried to make sure that the quality is maintained. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allen, did you still want an additional question? I know we've covered a lot of areas across the questions. We've covered, so far. actually, yeah. Um, yeah. Has anyone else got a question that they would like, like to ask? Can, can I, I just finish? Um, in the course of looking into this, I, I think, um, Councillor Wilson, you said they've always charged in Perth and Coon Ross. If we go right back to the creation of the Unity Authorities, Music tuition has always, uh, instrumental music tuition has always sat in a way outside the education core curriculum. And we've heard that some councils have taken different decisions. We've also talked about um, mechanisms of protecting the service either through a, 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 an allio. Um, if it became the conclusion, and it's not a given yet, but if the conclusion was that that, that had to that there had to be a, a kind of statutory requirement for instrumental music tuition. How would that be best achieved? Do you think it could be done through an expansion of the youth music initiative um, by, by guidelines in the curriculum, um, clearer guidelines towards councils in terms of the curriculum and, and work from Education Scotland in that area? How would, how would you see the best mechanism of achieving that? I hope we wouldn't get to that, is my first comment, uh, quite bluntly. Um, we have enough central control already in local government, and uh, it doesn't help having even more piled upon us, uh, to be candid. Um, if it came to that, we'd need to look at, at the options, um, some of which you've outlined. Um, I think losing local control and local participation would be a, a, a major factor. Um, I, I don't want to contemplate that. 
that model, but if we did, we'd need to look at the options. Okay, so can, uh, can I just add here, I think it's, um, uh, th this. it doesn't seem to me that this is a binary thing, that it's either a central government or it's local government. Um, my understanding of the way in which the curriculum works is that the level of devolution is down to the school, um, um, almost down to the teacher. Um, uh, uh, you know, there are variations uh, across Glasgow in the way in which um, uh, our, uh, some of our schools um, deal with the curriculum. Um, that variation and, and that flexibility is, is regarded as a strength in our system. When I say our system, I mean across the whole of Scotland. Um, so I don't, I don't read it as central government versus local government. Um, we are either going to have a situation in which um, um, we, we set something down in law uh, where everybody from local authority down to school uh, have to apply it, uh, or we're going to have flexibility, but that flexibility can be within the local authority as much as it's between local authority and central government. Councillor Dodds, you want to come? Yeah, um, I'm not sure that there is, a, there is a dichotomy between national and local. I think you could make it statutory and it would still be administered locally, but I think there are real dangers in that. Uh, if it's not accompanied by an increase in funding, then I think one of the real dangers is that you would uh, create a, <clears throat> a reduction to the, uh, the the lowest possible level, that everybody would, work, would, would consequently have to work to the statutory level because financially there's no option. And then in many cases, that would be a lower level than current provision. So there are dangers, I think, in going in that direction. I think it's best, uh, I, I said earlier, I think the service is best delivered locally. It would you agree that initiatives like Youth Music Initiative, um, which we've on, only heard good things about, yeah, I mean, the Youth Music Initiative is an example of how um, a, an objective can be achieved, um, working in partnership with government, um, and, and do you value the Youth Music Initiative um, in, in your own councils? I think we very much value the Youth Musical Initiative, and uh, it's something that, again, if you look at how the Youth Musical Initiative is uh, delivered across the country, it will be very different um, because of, of circumstances and simply what's available as well. Uh, it's a service that we contract out, we don't deliver it in-house, and I think that's probably the, the pattern across uh, <clears throat> uh, the country. But yeah, I think the, it is a model that has succeeded and uh, does allow an introduction to uh, uh, <clears throat> musical instruments, but the sustainability on an individual basis is much more questionable, I think. Councillor Cunningham, did you want to come in? No, I'm okay. Yeah. Just, just yes, of course, we value and welcome that initiative, but it, it should be mainstreamed and it should be fully funded. Mr Gray, you wanted to come in? Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, Cunningham's point about um, this shouldn't be a binary choice. Um, I mean, some of the drive, I think, for consideration of centralising or a national scheme is the breadth of the disparity in provision and charging across local authorities. I mean, is it beyond the wit of local authorities themselves through COSLA or otherwise to collaborate in some way to provide a more consistent provision, perhaps not identical, but more consistent across the country without national government stepping in? I, um and I wouldn't disagree with you. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a perfectly fair question. Um, it will raise uh, issues about um, uh, the extent to which um, you're levelling up or levelling down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we, do, do we want an equality of misery or do we want an equality of aspiration? Um, uh, uh, and you know, th that, that, is a, that is a choice which is going to have to be made. I, 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 I didn't say so much that it shouldn't be a binary choice, but that it isn't actually mm. a binary choice between local government and central government. Um, that, that there's much as much variation often within uh, within local government, um, within local authorities, in terms of the flexibility of, of curriculum provision. Um, and I don't see why music um, um, uh, necessarily is dramatically different to a lot of the other choices that, that occur within, uh, within local government. But yes, I mean, it can, can central government say to local government in general, can you please come up with a better model? That's a perfectly fair question. Um, uh, local government might turn around and say, well, actually, you're the guys that make the law. Um, uh, perhaps you should do that. But I would be very reluctant to see 
a situation in which this particular subject becomes enshrined uh, uh, in, in law or statute in a way that no other subject is. I just think that that would open the floodgates to every other subject advocate um, uh, charging through the door. Okay. Uh, Ms Smith? Thank you. Just one very brief point, and I entirely agree with um, Councillor Cunningham on that point. Um, would you countenance any um, regard for perhaps some international um, experience where um, the provision of musical instruments has been undertaken by bodies out with government altogether to try and help the funding uh, situation, by which I mean some uh, private trusts, or in some cases in, in America by the music industry itself. Would you, would you countenance that as worth looking at at all to get round, obviously, what's a very difficult problem for local authorities at the moment? I don't know the detail of what happens in, in those other places, but um, uh, I would tread very carefully where the example is that of the United States, where I suspect that um, uh, private institutions uh, feel the need to make up the gap in public provision. Um, and I wouldn't like to see a situation in which um, we become beholden to um, uh, external or private organizations uh, because um, uh, our system is so impoverished that we need that. Uh, I, I, I would find that very uncomfortable. I don't necessarily think that local uh, music groups and uh, uh, bands and so on couldn't have a role to play. Um, if there are organisations who are able to offer tuition to young people, I think that's all to the good, but I don't think it gets at the, uh, the heart of the problem. And I'm not aware of any kind of national institution that would be able to undertake that. And I think that that would come fraught with its own difficulties. So uh, I don't think it would uh, resolve the core problems. Like the man with the red flag in front of the train, I think I'd proceed with great caution on some of these suggestions, Convener. Um, I, I, I think our minds have got to be open to look at models. We are discussing this at COSLA, I think, on Friday morning, um, and we will deliberate on a number of issues there. Um, I'm cautious about the private sector, always. Um, members can try no more, no more questions. Can I thank uh, Councillor Wilson, Councillor George, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you very much for your time. Um, it's uh, been very helpful to the committee's work. Um, we will be continuing on the 5th of December when we will hear from the Cabinet Secretary and that will uh, uh, for educate and skills, and that will conclude the, um, the formal in, uh, inquiry sessions into our, our work at the moment. Um, just before we move into private section, remind everyone that next week we're here to um, hear evidence from government, government statisticians on school census information and school staff. And we now go into private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>